HMS Barham was the fourth ship laid down in the Queen Elizabeth class. She went on to fight in the Battle of Jutland, being the flagship for Rear Admiral Hugh Evan Thomas. In this role, she sustained damage in her long duel with the High Seas Fleet. Surviving the battle and the war, she served both in the Mediterranean and Atlantic fleets in the interwar period, being given a similar refit to the first one Queen Elizabeth received in the early 1930s. By the outbreak of the Second World War, she served first with the Mediterranean fleet and then with the home fleet, being battered by torpedoes within the first few months of the war, and more famously, off the coast of Libya, she was torpedoed and sunk by U-331. She was hit by three torpedoes. While taking on water, she rolled over to port. As men jumped into the water, a magazine explosion occurred, throwing men and debris into the air, where she sank in under a minute, taking 56 officers and 806 ratings with her. That is a long way off from the start of our story, as our story begins with the estimates for 1912-1913. As the Admiralty looked to build a new squadron of fast and powerfully armed battleships. In a recent video on Queen Elizabeth, I detailed this background, and if you would like some more background on the class as a whole, go check that video out. Anyway, Barham was built by the John Brown Dockyard and was laid down on February 24, 1913, launched on December 31, 1914, and commissioned by August 1915. As completed, she weighed around 27,000 tons and had a full load displacement of 32,500 tons. Her machinery was comprised of 24 Babcock and Wilcox boilers, giving steam to Parsons turbines, giving her a design maximum shaft horsepower of 56,000 and a design maximum speed of 23 knots. However, in her steam trials in July of 1916, she achieved a top speed of 24.22 knots. As for armament, she carried eight 15-inch 42 caliber guns in twin turrets, with two superfiring forward and two aft. Her secondary armament was comprised of 6-inch guns. Originally, she was to carry 16 of these. However, it was dropped down to 14. She also carried two 3-inch anti-aircraft guns, four 3-pounder saluting guns, 10 Lewis guns, and four underwater torpedo tubes. As for armor, she had a main belt with a maximum thickness of 13 inches, bulkheads of 6.4 inches. The decks varied in thickness, but the main deck was between 1 and a quarter inch and 2 inches, barbettes of between 4 inches and 10 inches, her turrets had a face thickness of 13 inches, with the rear sides and roof varying between 4 and a quarter inch and 11 inches. A conning tower with a maximum thickness of 11 inches. After commissioning in August of 1915, in October she joined the Grand Fleet in Scapa Flow. In November, the 5th Battle Squadron was created to be comprised of the five Queen Elizabeth class ships. The squadron had worked up to full strength by March to May of 1916, with the arrival of Valiant and Malaya forming one of the most powerful battleship squadrons the world had ever seen, with Barham as flagship. Back in December, Barham and Warspite collided in heavy seas. Because of the heavy seas, Barham had signaled the squadron to reduce speed to 8 knots, where Warspite misread the signal as they increased speed to 18 knots and began to overtake the flagship. In Robert K. Massey's excellent Castles of Steel, Britain, Germany, and the Winning of the Great War at Sea, he writes, Then just as Barham's stern sank into a deep trough, Warspite's bow, coming up behind, lifted high in the air. When the bow dropped, it came down on Barham, with a noise described as a horrible crunching, like a giant robot chewing on crowbars. Barham made it to Invergordon for repairs, rejoining the Grand Fleet by January 1st, 1916. By May of 1916, Admiral David Beatty had tried to get his hands on the Queen Elizabeth-class ships of the 5th Battle Squadron for some time wherein Commander-in-Chief of the Grand Fleet, Admiral John Jellicoe, had refused. But several circumstances reversed his decision. First, at the end of March, the Admiralty had learned that the Lutzow, new powerful battlecruiser, had joined the High Seas Fleet as flagship for Admiral Hipper of the 1st Scouting Group. Then, in late April, the battlecruisers Australia and New Zealand collided, forcing them both into dockyards for repairs. Now finally, and most crucially, with the lack of the gunnery range at the Firth of Forth, where Beatty was stationed, his battlecruiser's gunnery was overall subpar. In a meeting held at Rossyth on May 12, 1916, Jellicoe decided to bring the battlecruisers up to Scapa Flow squadron by squadron in hopes of correcting their gunnery. To plug the gap while some of his battlecruisers were away, Jellicoe sent the five ships of the 5th Battle Squadron to the Firth of Forth. Upon arriving in the Firth, Queen Elizabeth went into dockyard, leaving just four in the squadron for Rear Admiral Hugh Evan Thomas to command. In the time between the arrival of the 5th Battle Squadron and the Battle of Jutland, there was little communication between Beatty and Evan Thomas, 
the two men never sitting down to discuss tactics. This lack of understanding between the two commanders, namely with the follow-me style of battle that Beatty preferred, while Evan Thomas, a battleship man, was used to the explicit signals from the flagship in the Grand Fleet. This lack of understanding will play an important role in the battle. Early in the morning on May 31st, the High Seas Fleet under the command of Admiral Reinhard Scheer left Wilhelmshaven to head into the North Sea for what was to become the Battle of Jutland. The first scouting group, or the battle cruisers, under the command of Admiral Franz von Hipper, weigh to anchor at 3 a.m., making their way into the North Sea. Previously on the 30th, between 11 and 10 p.m., Beatty weighed to anchor with the 1st Battlecruiser Squadron, 2nd Battlecruiser Squadron, and the 5th Battle Squadron. By the early afternoon on the 31st, Beatty had made it to the agreed rendezvous point on the Long 40s, close to the Scandinavian coast. By 3 p.m., the battlecruiser forces Beatty and Hipper were not too far apart. An initial contact between the battlecruisers was soon made. By 3.30, Admiral Hipper understood that Beatty intended to cut him off from his home base and made a turn of 180 degrees to the southeast. Beatty, sensing the opportunity, increased speed to close with his foe, ordering even the 5th Battle Squadron to 25 knots, something that they could not do. By increasing his speed, Beatty left the four Queen Elizabeth-class ships behind, five miles to the rear of the 1st and 2nd Battlecruiser squadrons. Upon reaching what he felt to be the optimal position, Beatty ordered the battlecruisers to form a single line bearing northwest while pursuing the enemy on a southeasterly course. The signal for such an action was complicated and was unable to reach the bridge of Barham. Evan Thomas is said to have assumed that Beatty's other ship's maneuvers were a continuation of anti-submarine zigzagging. Whatever the case may be, Barham and her three giant sisters did not follow Beatty's order. So the 5th Battle Squadron continued on a course almost exactly the opposite of Beatty's southeasterly one. Seven minutes after the order was given, Beatty repeated the signal. Evan Thomas was nearly 10 miles away and therefore could not receive the signal. It would not be until 23 minutes after the engagement began that the powerful guns of the 5th Battle Squadron contributed to the battle. During the short lull at around 4 p.m., as Beatty's five remaining battlecruisers were repeatedly struck by German shells, Evan Thomas's 5th Battle Squadron had caught up with the battle and was coming in range of Hipper's line. With their flingers gunnery officer George Hassa saying, Behind the British battlecruiser line appeared four big ships. We soon identified these as Queen Elizabeth class. There had been much talk in our fleet of these ships. They carried a colossal armament of eight 15 inch guns, 28,000 tons displacement, and a speed of 25 knots. They fired a shell more than twice as heavy as ours. They engaged us at portentous ranges. The 5th Battle Squadron, being meticulously schooled in gunnery at Scapa Flow by Jellico, was one of the most accurate shooting squadrons in the Grand Fleet. After a few spotting rounds from the forward turrets of Barham, Valiant, and Warspite, Evan Thomas turned his ships 45 degrees to starboard, paralleling Hipper's course, and at 4.10 p.m., salvos of 15-inch shells from Barham and her sisters began raining down on Von der Tan and Moltke, with both Von der Tan and Moltke being hit shortly after. Initially aiming at von der Tan and scoring hits, Barham and company with Valiant focused on Moltke. Following the loss of Queen Mary, Beatty only led four battlecruisers, and his flagship, Lion, was taking a pounding. At around 440, the first phase of the battle, the so-called Run of the South, was over, as Beatty reversed course and headed north. However, the 5th Battle Squadron continued to head on a southerly course, with the two groups passing each other at 450. Then, just a few minutes before 5 o'clock, when the Queen Elizabeth wheeled around north, three miles in Beatty's wake, the four ships would have to entertain the High Seas Fleet until they could rendezvous with Jellico. Steaming northward, Evan Thomas distributed his fire. Barham and Valiant were to deal with the five German battlecruisers, while Malaya and Warspite dealt with the leading elements of the High Seas Fleet, the four Koning-class ships. And so, for the next hour or so, the 5th Battle Squadron engaged the German High Seas Fleet. Barham was the first to be struck in the run to the north. In all, Barham was struck a total of six times in the battle, from the 11 and 12 inch gun vessels she faced. With one of the shells wrecking the auxiliary wireless office and inflicting casualties on both wireless and medical personnel, another shell burst causing a fire in a six inch casemate. As the shells crashed into the British battleships, the four roared back with their 32 15 inch guns. Barham and Valiant scored hits on Sedlitz, Lutzau, and Der Flinger. As time dragged on and it seemed that the Queen Elizabeth might be overtaken by the High Seas Fleet, by 6pm help was arriving with Jellicoe's Grand Fleet 
and Admiral Horace Hood's 3rd Battlecruiser Squadron. By this point in the battle, the run to the north was over, and the Queen Elizabeth joined the Grand Fleet. Beatty and Evan Thomas deliberately separated to join at the very end of the line behind Agincourt. Accordingly, at 6.18pm, the 5th Battle Squadron began to turn to port. As Evan Thomas's four battleships wheeled around under fire from Shear's advanced line of Koenigs, Farm had to turn sharply and reduce speed to make room for Marlborough Squadron to pass ahead. The Queen Elizabeth continued to take a pounding, with Warspite being hit, causing her rudder to jam and turn in circles, with the High Seas Fleet focusing on her, then soon the Cruiser Warrior. But by 6.30, the Grand Fleet had come into line and was now crossing the Germans' T. By 6.40, Barham, Valiant, and Malaya were actually forming a stern of Agincourt. As the battle continued, the Queen Elizabeth kept up with the rest of the Grand Fleet and continued with the action. However, as night fell and Marlborough, who had been torpedoed, was no longer able to keep up with the Grand Fleet, her squadron consisting of Revenge, Hercules, and Agincourt, along with the three Queen Elizabeths, were assigned to guard her. These ships had a clear view of Shear's battleships when they passed by only three miles astern at around 10 p.m. Taking from Castles of Steel once again, in fact, Barm had already witnessed constant attacks by torpedo craft on ships first to the west and then to the north. So had Valiant, the third of the three Queen Elizabeths. At 11.35, we observed heavy firing on our starboard quarter. They appeared to be two German cruisers with at least two funnels and a crane amidships. The profile of German dreadnoughts. Steering eastward at high speed, these cruisers then evidently sighted an unknown small number of British ships ahead of them, possibly a light cruiser and a few destroyers. Despite these observations, Evan Thomas, who had 24 15-inch guns at his command, did nothing. Not only that, but later on in the night, Seidlitz came dangerously close to the 5th Battle Squadron, and again, no action was taken. By this point in the battle, it was June 1st, and the Battle of Jutland was over for Barham and the rest of the 5th Battle Squadron. Now obviously, there's a lot more detail about Jutland, and the miscues by Beatty and Evan Thomas. However, for the most part, I will choose not to comment on them, as that's not my place. Barham rejoined the Grand Fleet in July after being repaired and as the Great War dragged on, no further major fleet engagements occurred, although having been close several times. Following the end of the Great War and the disbandment of the Grand Fleet in April 1919, she joined the Atlantic Fleet until November of 1924, being transferred to the Mediterranean as part of the 1st Battle Squadron as Squadron Flag. Between December 1927 to February 1928, she, in company with Ramillies, carried out a showing of the flag mission along Africa's west coast. Following this, she went to Portsmouth for a refit until July, then relieving Warspite as she had run aground, temporarily transferring to the home fleet for a time, being there when her refit came in December of 1930. Taking from R.A. Burt's British Battleships 1919-1945, he describes her changes. 1. Beam and displacement changes as Queen Elizabeth, i.e. larger in both regards. 2. Range clocks over X turret removed. Multiple two-pounder AA eight barrels added port and starboard on race platform, a beam funnel. Multiple half-inch AA four barrels added port and starboard on superstructure, a beam conning tower. High-angle director fitted on platform on main tripod legs. AA lookout positions added port and starboard below control top. After pair of torpedo tubes removed. Torpedo range finders removed from after superstructure. 3. RDF equipment as in Queen Elizabeth, 1930 type aerial. 4. SL tower around the funnel are modified, but the arrangement of the SL is unchanged. 2. 24 inch signaling SL remounted on lower bridge. 5. Training type catapult fitted on starboard side of X turret roof, with straight arm crane, a beam main mast to starboard side. Aircraft platforms removed from turrets. 6. Anti torpedo bulges fitted as in Queen Elizabeth. 7. Bridge enlarged and modified and funnels trunked as in Queen Elizabeth. The upper bridge is completely enclosed in addition to the lower bridge extended further aft than in other ships. The entire bridge structure now merges with tripod legs. 8. Tripod legs fitted to main mast to support high angle director arrangement of signal struts below the control top modified. Then to make things a bit easier between March and June of 1938, Barham had further modifications. 1. Single 4-inch AA replaced by twin and large shields. High angle radio frequency over bridge removed. 2. 36-inch SL replaced by 44-inch. She was modified further in the following years with anti-aircraft guns added, along with radar upgrades. As I mentioned in my video about Queen Elizabeth, 
There's a lot more to discuss when it comes to the refits of these ships, and it's something we will discuss at a further point. But for the sake of time, let's move on. She was commissioned at Portsmouth following her refit in January of 1934 as the second battle squadron flag. Then in 1935, she was transferred to the Mediterranean as a general reshuffling of the battleships, with the Queen Elizabeth switching places with the Royal Sovereigns. Spending a majority of the interwar period in the Mediterranean with brief visits to the United Kingdom. As the Second World War broke out, she spent September, October, and November deployed with the Mediterranean fleet, being transferred to the home fleet in December, and while en route on the 13th, she collided with the destroyer Duchess, sinking her and taking a large portion of the crew down with the destroyer. In December, she assisted in convoy escorting duties until, on the 28th of December, where off the Hebrides, she was torpedoed in the bows by the U-boat U-30 making her way under her own power to Liverpool by the 29th. Her repairs took until April 1940, where she spent the next several months working up until late August, where she was part of a detachment to bombard Dakar along with Resolution, Ark Royal, Devonshire, Cumberland, Fiji, and 10 destroyers. Arriving off Dakar on the 23rd, in the bombardment she was to focus fire on the incomplete Richelieu, whereas the shore batteries focused fire on Barham, being hit repeatedly. Following the torpedoing of Resolution on the 25th, Barham towed her to Freetown. Following this, she made her way to Gibraltar, and then in November, she was transferred to the Mediterranean fleet, being attached to Force H for the first part of the journey to Malta, arriving in Alexandria on the 14th, with several deployments in the Mediterranean in November and December. As for January 1941, in company with Valiant and Warspite, screened by destroyers, they steamed for Bardia, with air cover from Illustrious helping to capture the city. Following this, she helped to escort Illustrious to Malta and then troops. By late March, the war in the Mediterranean having expanded, the Regia Marina intended to sink troop convoys heading from Egypt to Greece in company with the Regia Aeronautica and the German Luftwaffe. To defend against such an attack, Admiral Cunningham put to sea with Warspite, Valiant, Barham, and the carrier Formidable, screened by cruisers and destroyers. The ensuing Battle of Cape Matapan between the 27th and 29th of March, 1941, was one of the most decisive fleet engagements of the war in the Mediterranean. Seeing how our story focuses on Barham, we will skip ahead to the night action between the 28th and 29th. At 9.11pm when the commander of the cruisers, Pridham Whipple, reported a stopped ship, this being the Italian cruiser Pola, came in, Cunningham steered his ships in the reported direction. By 10.23pm, the escorting destroyer spotted shapes on the horizon, and two minutes later, the outline of two ships could be seen, these being the cruisers Zara and Fiume, detached to assist the crippled Pola. Where I think Dark Seas, the Battle of Cape Matapan, puts it better than I could. The next few minutes were decisive. The CNC altered course to starboard, bringing the fleet again into a single line ahead. Almost at the same time, Greyhound, which was then drawing ahead, opened her searchlight. Its beam fell right across the water, most valuably illuminating a cruiser, without revealing the position of our battleships. The formidable, being obviously of no value in a gun action, hauled out of line to starboard. The Warspite's turrets opened fire, followed almost immediately by the Valiants. A salvo of 15-inch shells crashed into the Fiume. Her after turret was blown overboard, she listed heavily to starboard, and burst into a sea of flame. She was driven out of line and seems to have sunk or blown up 30 minutes later. Just before the enemy cruisers were sighted, the Barham, in the rear of the line, had sighted the Pola on the port quarter, making identification signals, and had trained her turrets on her. When the Greyhound's searchlight shone out, the Barham trained forward at once, opening fire on the leading ship. A brilliant orange flash shot up under the bridge, and bursts were along the whole length of the ship, which turned to starboard and made off to the westward, making smoke. The Italians lost three cruisers and multiple destroyers in this action with Barham returning to Alexandria the following day. The next couple of months would see her escorting convoys and assisting in bombardments, and finally in May, she sailed to help to defend Crete. On the 27th, she came under air attack and sustained serious damage after a bomb hit on Y turret, with fires and flooding due to near misses. Following this, she sailed to Durban in South Africa for repair, and was there until rejoining the Mediterranean fleet in August being deployed for fleet duties in the eastern Mediterranean in October. In late November, she was supporting operations off the Libyan coast, when, on the 25th, while cruising in a single line with Queen Elizabeth and Valiant, while zigzagging, Barham was struck by three torpedoes from U-331. 
The submarine was spotted and began taking fire from the surrounding ships. Taking from Sub-Lieutenant D.E. Trench's report from Valiant and R.A. Burt's British Battleships 1919-1945, as soon as the smoke and spray had cleared away and Barn became visible again, it was seen that she had developed a very heavy list of port, probably about 20 to 30 degrees, as it was observed that the water was level with the after screen door into the lobby at the fore end of the quarter deck, she appeared to hang in this position for about a minute, when she began to roll over on approximately an even keel. She continued to roll over and sink deeper into the water until the water was seen to be entering the funnel. A moment or two after this was a loud explosion amidships, and a very large column of black and brown smoke with flame from the explosion in the middle of it shot into the air. This explosion occurred at 1630, or five minutes approximately after the torpedoes hit, when Barham was just abaft the beam from Valiant's bridge. This explosion occurred in the six-inch magazines amidships, and she sank one minute later. Fifty-six officers, including the captain, and 806 ratings were lost. I feel an appropriate end to this tale is to give you an account of a survivor in full. One Lieutenant G.M. Wolfe. This too coming from R.A. Burt's British Battleships 1919-1945. Wolfe says, At the time of the first explosion, I was just outside my office, which was on the port side of the ADO flat, that is, the first deck above the boat deck on the bridge structure. Since I was leaving the office, I was facing aft and saw the flash of the explosion, which appeared to be immediately above the funnel. After a slight pause, two further explosions occurred, both slightly further aft. I crossed immediately to the starboard side, where a crowd was already gathering on the upper deck, and gave my pocket knife to a PO, who was trying to unlash two carly floats, which were secured at the bottom of the ladder up to the pom-pom deck. I went rapidly back to my office for my Burberry, and then returned to the starboard side, with some difficulty, as there was already an appreciable list. I descended to the upper deck, where the ship's company was already going over the side. I shouted to all near me to follow their example, rather unnecessarily, as there was little panic and the men were not wasting any time. The list was steadily increasing, and as everyone about me was over the guardrail, I went over also at a point level with the forward end of the bridge and slid down to the bilge keel. By now, she was going over fast, and I reached the bottom of the ship, now an almost vertical wall. Here, I hesitated, owing to the difficulty of keeping my balance, because the final jump appeared to be hazardous, with the bottom coming up to meet me. It was then a big explosion took place aft, and the ship plunged over so rapidly that it was flung backwards into the water with many others. After being sucked down, we eventually surfaced, and I swam over to a carly float, which appeared close at hand. All trace of the ship had vanished. I discarded my Burberry, blew up my life belt, and held onto the side of the float, with many more until picked up by HMS Hotspur one hour later. I hope you all enjoyed this look at HMS Barham. When it comes to her story, there's a lot of detail, and trying to fit it all into one video is quite difficult. Nevertheless, she participated in important battles, like Jutland and the Battle of Cape Matapan, in both playing a crucial role. Thank you all for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe as it will help the channel to grow. And until next time, my friends, have a great day.